you are, I would say, the OG celebrity founder. You have been 10 years of Honest Company. A little, little more than that. But well, yeah. A little bit more than that. Totally. Okay. <laughs> Tell us, how does it feel 10 years later? With me in the business, I was so hard on myself for so long. And then I got to a place where I like gave myself some grace. Like I take in the lessons of the challenges or, or the hardships and also allow myself to like receive the wins. I used to be up until not too long ago, wildly uncomfortable with taking in anything that was good. I felt so undeserving. So I think that's another thing is um, maybe when there's so few of us at the table in those positions of power, um, especially, you know, we do make up 50% of the population, but we're so wildly un underrepresented in business in a lot of power rooms. And when you don't see yourself, you feel like maybe you don't deserve to be there. Um, and that's fake news, right? It's the conditioning. Uh, that we're used to, that we grew up with, that we have to unwind. So it's been an amazing journey and, um, and, and, and very fulfilling. It's cool how it can take on so many different waves as, as you grow. So the company started with a more narrow selection of baby products, wipes, personal and it's care. personal care and it's and expanded. Cleaning. How do you guide the strategy of a now publicly traded company? I started with 17 products in three pretty large sectors. Um, I felt like I needed to test out whether there was going to be reception of um, clean in these pretty major categories, home, uh, detergent space, uh, the personal care space which is not necessarily beauty, but kind of, it's like what you put on your skin, what you put around the home, which is the detergents and cleaning. And then obviously on the thing that's gonna touch probably the most vulnerable people, which are babies. So that's why I chose those three categories. And what I was really trying to solve for or tackle is the injustice that we face every day in being exposed to unnecessary and harmful chemicals that actually cause lots of illness. And these companies that are making these chemicals that put them in the products that are in on and around all of us every day. And I was like, maybe there can be a more human way to approach business. And so I really was trying to tackle these sort of like giant categories in my small little tiny way. And that's why I created a company that went into three different pretty big categories, 17 products. And I launched online because I felt like that was going to give me, I guess, the, um, the ability or the leverage to show that no matter where you lived, you should have access to these types of products. You didn't need to just live next to said store um, to access it and to make this information just more accessible also to everyone. I think a lot of people didn't know that, you know, if you go to the grocery or if you go to a department store, um, you think if you spend more money on it, it's gonna be safer. Or if you go to that store that you grew up going to, uh, it was gonna be safer, but it's actually not. There's no real laws that um, protect human health or, or really protect you uh, around your, your safety, even for pregnant women, there's no real laws that say that companies can't market products to pregnant women and make sure that they're actually safe for pregnant women. There's no laws protecting babies that, you know, if something is marketed for you to use on or near your baby, that it's actually safe for that baby. And there's certainly no laws saying that Anything that you comes in contact with your skin or your environment will be safe for you. So they're testing on us. And I was like, what the heck? So that's why I went into all those different product categories. Um, and then can you really uh, differentiate? Can you really stand up 
against competition? Is there a real reason for you to be there? And can you do it at a price that's within reach? Because um, there's a lot of things we can do for like a million bucks. <laughs> but if you're trying to make it accessible, um, can you scale the idea? Can you take us behind the scenes of what it looks like to take a company public and specifically your company public and really navigating the seas of a historically male dominated stock market? I would say that if you have a peaceful, relaxing life and you sleep well at night, don't take your company public. <laughs> <laughs> but who has that? No, I'm kidding. No, it's actually, it's actually important for us to take our companies public it's actually necessary. Between 2013 and, and 2020, there were over 2,000 companies that went public, and only 18 of them had female leadership. That's wild. It was a really brutal experience. They really do try to throw as many banana peels in front of you as humanly possible. And I would say that there's probably no one better to navigate banana peels than a woman in business. We get these things thrown at us, left, right, and center. So you're the youngest Latina ever to take a company public, which I think deserves a big round of applause. So you just talked about how hard it was to get there. What was it like then ringing that bell? It was interesting um, because I think when I started the business, it was really around this social justice of like, how can I make sure that more people have access to live their best life, access to the information, access to products. Um, hopefully if I can get the consumers to feel more empowered, we can actually start to change other companies and other companies' values. And, um, and there will be a bit of a groundswell. So now, you know, before everyone was like, what does clean mean? Uh, is that a thing that only moms care about? Now you literally can't walk into a store without seeing clean beauty, um, without seeing products that are clean and better for you, basically in every category. Um, and I'm really proud that it only took 10 years for that to happen, to literally create that space. Um, and a lot of the competitors are forced to step up, which is awesome. And certainly getting our, us to that finish line that it wasn't until I was like writing the speech with Jen, who's here, who's um, head of Marcom, and she's my, one of my writer dies that's been with me. Um, and, you know, we were writing the, the, she was like, you have to do a speech. Um, and this was like, you know, we were the first company during COVID to actually do it in the NASDAQ offices. So it was like a whole situation. We weren't sure. Were we going to do it there? We're going to be remote. And I realized in that moment um, that sort of in, it, it was like a call to action, but also a way to kind of show up for a community of people that, for the most part, have never been on that stage. And I was like, okay. So I felt that. And then that, I guess, I mean, I know it gave me the strength to really allow the moment to breathe and be what it needed to be, which is I got this far so that not only did I like open the door, but I blew the doors open and I mowed down a lot of those hills so that a lot more can come through. And so I just wanted to make sure that anybody who was watching or listening um, in that moment or any moment can see that that's, that that's what me being there meant. I felt like it was easier to control my destiny launching a D2C brand. And I would say I recommend that for anyone, having your foundational principles in D2C because you, there's nothing like that ownership, right? It's sort of like the flagship store. Imagine your flagship being online. And so take care of that and no one can like take that away from you. And it's sort of like your nucleus than it, anything else can happen from there. But ultimately you have to be where the consumer wants you to be. And so if the consumer wants you to be in a brick and mortar, go to make sure you have that. 
Um, if they want you to ha be in a retail channel, make sure you're there or partner with, you know, wherever there's more ease for them to find you, frankly. I don't think we should be too married to any model. I think social commerce is actually 10 years behind what, where it should be, frankly. Um, and that's probably where it's, it's all going anyway. When you control the relationship with the consumer, you just have so much more power. And you can test and learn a lot more. Um, you don't have to rely so much on others um, for innovation. So my final question for you, and to say thank you also for joining us, this has been so fun. In the beginning, we introduced you as an actress, an entrepreneur, a founder. How would you introduce yourself? I'm a terrible speller. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an amateur chef. Um, I, I think I dream big. I'm a dreamer. And I believe in people. I do. And I believe in goodness. And I have hope. My job, I think, is probably to unlock as much of that as possible. And whether that's through telling stories and entertainment or telling stories through product, great. Um, so maybe that's how I would describe myself. And a very imperfect mom, but um, my kids still tell me their secrets, so that's cool. <laughs> Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. So lovely to have you. Thank you.